First of all, I would like to thank Newton for the kind invitation. I would like to thank Alex and Natalia for distributing these products in Spain and the chairs for moderating this interesting session. If I may, I would like to introduce ourselves. We are called Instituto Girado. We are a team of radiologists. We are part of a project with our venture capital. We are radiologists. Our goal is to do things well, which may sound trivial, but it's not. The center was established at Dr. Girado, who was an ENT specialist. Then she passed it over to us. And five years ago, in Barcelona, I mean, in the past five years, we grew a lot because we get many patients referred. We've got a center with six MRIs, of which five CTs eight CBCTs, ultrasounds, desitometry, mammography, and we also then do a teleradiology for many other centers. Dr. Salmeron, who's here today, is part of this group, and the same is true for myself. We were not familiar with this technique. We introduced it in 2016, and we at attended the 2016 20th anniversary New Tom Convention. We have all modalities. As a radiology center, we need to provide an overall imaging. So we have a team, a dental team. We have an ENT team. There we have Dr. Salmeron. And then another MSK team which is the one I had. Our team is highly functional. We have many technicians. So the radiological technician must be deeply involved in this process. There is a lot of post-processing. There is a very important and steep learning curve, as we will see. As I said, we've had all models. Not all of them can deal with MSK. We've got now 5G Excel, and these are the main one we use for MSK applications. My presentation will be me telling you a story. It won't be that scientific. It was almost a marriage, a love story between uh, the con beam technology and its best representative, uh, the new Tom, and the Institute Gir Girado, uh, because we started applying this technique after falling in love with it. As I was saying, uh, physicians ask us for increasing information to refine uh, their treatments. Why? And how have we made uh, clinical decisions over the past few years? So we did that uh, thanks to Newton many models. Uh, and we'll see what we use it, uh, first of all, to detect uh, fractures, uh, to follow them up for arthros, CBCT, uh, surgical uh, uh, procedures and osteosynthesis, uh, specific protocols uh, for lower limbs, uh, and also to uh, evaluate uh, the stability of uh, implants. The protocol is called PERTH. We also have experience with tumors, uh, uh, also for imaging guided biopsies. Uh, so we try to uh, then benefit as much uh, from images. Once we uh, achieve uh, good quality images, then we try to glean as much information as possible from them. We try to have a biomarkers uh, to establish what uh, traumatologists uh, will be asking us and uh, provide them uh, with parameters as opposed to just absolute figures. And then at the end, I'll be talking about uh, the cost side. How, so how much this technology costs with a V MDCT? We'll see the uh, pros and cons of this technology. I'm sure that you're familiar with them, but I thought I would recap them. 
So we'll talk about the present, past, and future clinical applications. And I don't need to delve into the technique because I'm sure you're familiar with them. So as I said, those is very important for us. I know that there is a UA regulation about those exposure. However, after the COVID the pandemic, at least in Spain, it was quite difficult to use this technology. We could do so since we are a private center. So what we did at the beginning was to publish many papers to see whether our machines were working properly vis-a-vis -vis others. It turned out that the corn beam CT technology in the MSK will help to dramatically lower the dose. That's why we no longer helicoidal CT for MSK. 90% of that is done with CBCT. What are its benefits? Well, as we all know, it all started with dental radiology and everything could then be applied to traumatology. Those uh, uh, limiting because we only irradiate uh, the area under investigation and that's something that uh, today's radiologists are not that familiar with because when you use a multi-detector CT, you just irradiate everything. And that's something that it took us some time to understand, but then we passed light with modulation and the other accessories that can be found in the cone beam CT, we finally understood that we can lower the dose. Also, the uh, imaging time is shorter, uh, quality, the quality of the image is better. Uh, there is also a multi-planar reconstruction with exact measurements and lots of details. We can uh, display bony microarchitecture and bone quality is like performing a micro CT. We have fewer metal artifacts, as somebody said already. Post up, so follow up is great. What about uh, the downside? I mean, low resolution for soft tissues. In the MSK domain, we have always used MRI. We were not worried that the CBCT could not do that because we could resort to MRI. So that's why at first we were not that worried about that issue. The second bullet point is artifacts. So it's not actually up to us, but rather up to the manufacturers to minimize artifacts more and more. Another downside was the presence of noise in images. There's about twice as much noise as in a conventional CT. And then, unfortunately, we also discovered that there was a learning curve. Our technicians had to invest months before they could grow familiar with this technique. Another disadvantage is FOV until 7G and then a patient's movement, which is quite normal in radiology. So the higher the accuracy, the more a patient is likely to move. We've got a 3D high resolution as a tropy technique. Uh, slices are much thinner, 100 uh, microns or even less than that. Just recently, we performed a study with an exact dose and it turned out that we're over 50% below that dose. So we do not irradiate our patients that much. We've got fewer metal artifacts. The technique is cheaper and we can also upgrade more often since they're cheaper. And we can also provide figures. So that's why in February 2016, we decided to buy a 5G. With that technique, we saw there are things uh, such as uh, short-sightedness. I mean, I'm short-sighted. Uh, we know that certain things cannot be 
seen a wise that can be shown with a con being a CT and the opposite was also true. It's a bit like being short sighted. One of the first things I did was try and um, get rid of this uh, traditional helicoidal uh, CT as uh, we've done in the dental field and the same we try to do at first also for the MSK uh, uh, system that's the field we used uh, with uh, 7G which is not problematic at all it's just perfect and the dose is really low since we are radiologists uh, with uh, the advent uh, of uh, AI and deep learning, uh, now we have made the CONBIM CTC be part uh, of a, a learning system together with the other modalities. So part uh, of the AI we applied to MRI was applied to CONBIM CT2. What's our habitual use, uh, then fracture assessment, uh, uh, then uh, dislocation and follow-up. We've got some problems with uh, bone edema because uh, at first we're not able to display an edema confidently. So that's why we decided to go back uh, to MRI. CBCT compared uh, to uh, plain film uh, conventional x-ray displacement fractures uh, since it's a 3D technique. And despite just a slightly high radiation, we can detect uh, whether there is a fracture or not. Uh, that will also affect uh, the treatment choice, uh, both complex and comminuted fractures. Uh, and then also traumatologists uh, are much more confident uh, they see what's there. And then also then uh, loading may be an issue you know there is a boom of using uh, then uh, cbct and uh, loading we can perform a number of assessments uh, uh, union uh, we can display uh, then uh, implant uh, loosening uh, for instance a problem caused by the trabecular bone And as we are seeing in our normal techniques, such as playfilm X-ray, ultrasound, many patients changed, or many cases, we changed our clinical decisions. So in bone tumors, we also try to perform an MRI. But in this case, what else do we get from CBCT? Well, we get lots of interesting things uh, such as the cortical bone and then a periosteal reaction which is otherwise difficult to detect at first uh, we thought it was a sarcoma and then realized it was not it's very much about uh, the way you can display with uh, high resolution cone beam ct and there you can also display uh, soft tissue it's a bit like in the mouth of course there is a limitation with soft tissues but the same is true for mri because uh, if we've got lots of soft tissues uh, they will also inject a contrast medium and therefore the answer is MRI as opposed to MDCT but in order to see the cortical bone you can do that we also use it uh, also myelitis it does uh, I mean in our normal routine uh, we do not use convincity but we are gradually introducing it so that's why in uh, in traumatologists uh, conferences we try to introduce that even more i mean for instance for sequestration and uh, chronic osteomyelitis then cbct is perfect there I don't want to uh, delve too much into detail, just in passing, arthrographies. One of the main constraints we had uh, with MRI is that a uh, traumatologist uh, performed the arthroscopy and they saw extensive uh, ulcerations which had not been displayed with MRI, so we saw some cartilage, but we had not seen an extensive ulceration. 
So that's why there was a big distance between two contrary defects, but that's something we have not displayed. If you have a high spatial and contour resolution and the fact that you can form a CBCT arthrographies, then these contrary effects tend to be much lower because they could not be displayed with MRI. Because in the MRI, you often do not see any lesions of the articular cartilage, but you can do so with SBCT arthrographies for any joints, then wrist, ankle, we introduce it everywhere. Arthrography can display then cartilage ligaments, I mean it's high, not as well as MRI, but at least you can show them in the then multiple uh, reoperated knees uh, with many artifacts, arthrography can help us. We've got uh, many cases of such patients uh, undergoing multiple surgeries, uh, especially say, take a footballer or an athlete who was uh, twice operated on uh, for crusade ligaments uh, with the two uh, operated the mini side and there we always do a CBCT arthrography with very thin slices with a high 3D uh, section. Intraticular bodies uh, are easier to see in, and also any overgrowth that can be easily characterized. Other indications are uh, anatomical uh, uh, variants uh, of osteoarthrosis, uh, that uh, accessory bones, uh, supernumerary teeth, uh, and also investigation and research. Very little research is done. That's why we try to do whatever we can in the line of research. Let's now review some cases. I'll do that very quickly because it's quite difficult to recap IVS in just 20 minutes. So what's the best justification for CBCT arthrography to, to assess everything, especially operated beneath sign? Then we also introduced pre-op assessment implants with a protocol rotational examination of lower limbs in young patients. We always try to use uh, this technique uh, to lower uh, those ir irradiation fractions uh, and also we try to introduce other aspects, uh, especially for our research work, uh, not just MSK but also ENT and dental in addition to MSK. Uh, then uh, the retrieval spine, uh, We've done quite a lot there and also uh, for radio motion. This image is taken back to 2016. That was 5G. So the cause of diagnosis is slightly different. If you see these images, it's almost as if you need uh, to then study anatomy once again. Now let's compare it to the change that resulted when the uh, high and low resonance field when we felt we had to go back to our textbooks again. I mean, I remember still a traumatologist who asked me for this uh, CT and we did the convinced CT in 2016. When he saw that, he grew scared. He found it difficult to plan with seeing those uh, angled uh, cortical bones. So, so that's the sort of resolution you can achieve. It can be well uh, characterized since it's isotropic. You've got three isotropic uh, planes, so it's perfect to see whether it's ventricular or not. And then the 3D dimension is really helpful, especially for traumatologists. Osteochondromas, we saw very many at the beginning. And that's one of the benefits of a conbicitin, especially Liz Frank, then thin fractures, which are not easily visible with MRI, and then the injuries of the second finger or tone lacerations. This was a 25 year old patient. There had to be a checkup when we saw there were many screws in place. We thought we wouldn't see anything, but it wasn't true. We were able to characterize well, well all cortical bones and structures. 
this is a patient dating back to only two days ago I'd like to show you just to make you understand that something we did at the time this was an old fracture with limited range of motion a traumatologist wanted to know more about that one of the things we do since we've got such a high resolution is to try to then have arthrography in negative so we see the whole of the contour so we see the whole of the contour when here there is a, a defect uh, and when there is a, a rupture so it's much easier to make a diagnosis And the same is true for this image. There is a, an amazing resolution. You can see all ligaments. You can characterize them all. This was one of the first examinations we did. This is what the traumatologist showed. I think there is a spectacular outcome. And then fractures of the posterior a pillar of the tibial epiphysis uh, they're easy to display also the third distal uh, section of the radio so we have seen all types of fractures uh, you know especially wrist fractures and traumatologists have by now grown accustomed to seeing uh, such excellent images so they find it easy to interpret them and it's easier to ha talk to them when we can use uh, these images let me show you some more fractures tiny fractures too they would be otherwise invisible to plain film x-ray and then uh, two or three weeks uh, go by and they finally uh, then uh, come up but we can uh, uh, avoid uh, wasting so much time such as in this case uh, the cortical plate uh, then uh, small uh, tears in the pyramidal ligament uh, and the traumatologist is even better uh, uh, than us uh, seeing them this is the uncinate bone uh, the scaphoid fractures uh, well in the latter we can well characterize the, where there is a gap, uh, a nauseous bridge uh, or a column. And we thought we'd also then characterize the edema and the sclerosis. I mean, that's easy because we're accustomed to them. But uh, to say that there is an extra necrosis is not that easy. Sometimes uh, just to be on the safe side, you resort to MRI, instabilities, uh, carpal middle third you see that it's quite easy to measure the angle of the fractures fractures of the head of the radio with this technique you can basically see all fractures without moving the patient you can see them all and the same is true for small fissures Here too, this uh, cubital bone uh, fracture, this too, I mean, this is a technique uh, we uh, use, it's a 3D or CD rendering, it's like being at the movie theater, and I must say the traumatologists love these images, and also the patient understands very well what is going on with him or her. This is a fracture of the tibial eminence in a child, fractures of the fifth metatarsal, the union, I mean, for many external fixations, it's not easy to see the defects in the humerus. We also had a protocol for the post-surgical rotation of these implants. Also, wrist arthrodesis is easily visible much better than MRI even though we tend to perform both but then to see the cartilage ligaments and impingements is definitely easier here fractures ruptured ligaments and fibrous cartilage and that's the noise uh, you sometimes get I mean that's not something that disturbs us uh, as a radiologist but traumatologists are not happy it's not that uh, they 
technology is poor, but it's intrinsic in uh, this uh, technology, also in the hip. In this, this is one of the cases we performed in uh, Arthros in BCT. There was already other MRIs with three Tesla, and a colleague asked us uh, to repeat the assessment because of the metal uh, artifacts. Uh, he could not see properly. Here you see there is a chondral flap that was not visible with MRI. And here you perfectly see the cartilage with the chondral contra defects of chocolate and uh, surgical beams uh, that were not visible with MRI so we can easily display in uh, compartments uh, we can perform a perfect staging of the various compartments uh, and then when we perform a CBCT sometimes uh, then we get uh, a CT or the, te the technician uh, guess it uh, wrong and uh, our I had grown used uh, to CBCT we never see screws with that level of detail this uh, is a comparative MRI so but as I said in the past uh, never had we seen uh, screws uh, so accurately here you see the tip of the screw Accu track you can see exactly it's in a core so that was a graft plus fixation humerus fractures metatarsal fractures and this was a very difficult case for MDCT because it was a graft and an arthrodesis of the wrist and I must say that we were quite surprised in 2016 because uh, we did not realize they could assess so many things. And this is an example of osteomyelitis. It's a, a bone sequestration, as I said at the beginning. You can display then uh, osteochondral uh, lesions, uh, union, pins, uh, here too. I mean, with CT would be difficult. You don't really see then what's inside the screw. At the beginning, I showed you that we followed the PET protocol to mobilize the hip. But then you see that comparing the two, there you could see fragments that were not visible with MDCT. And now with 7G, we have a longer stitching we no longer need to investigate uh, implants uh, bit by bit, uh, but we can go from tip to tip, uh, both for the femur and for the knee. Also periprosthetic uh, fracture. So we're really satisfied uh, because with the Conbin CT, we can provide lots and lots of information about any joint. Uh, here you see a rotation examination measurements uh, and justification is a very low dose. Uh, this uh, is an osteochondroma, the fourth metatarsal that was uh, well characterized. And there's something else we always try to do. is uh, to have a, a hybrid situation because we always uh, compare MRI to CBCT. So stable uh, lesions uh, that may appear stable uh, with the one technique uh, will uh, appear unstable with the other technique. So we just uh, receive additional information. Here you see some examples uh, under middle uh, impactations, uh, the chronic osteomesial lesions, uh, and then investigation and studies. Uh, this is a PhD dissertation, a cadaver study. You see a comparison between CBCT and CT. As you can see, the resolution on the left is amazing, especially posterior here too. In these intervitreal spaces, it would be much difficult by just using uh, ordinary MDCT as opposed to CBCT. And the same applies to the actual view. And this was uh, what the PhD student did for his dissertation. Here, once again, you see some cadaver, sta cadaver studies. 
once again it was compared to MRI. Another thing we do is to investigate head and neck instabilities. We can perform flexion, hyperflexion investigation both inside and outside. They will also may cause the head to drop forward and backward in standing. And then we perform MRI to characterize the flow. One of the problems is the uh, blood flow in the brain, so we calculate parameters, uh, we calculate the brain volume. So this investigation provides us lots and lots of information and allows the physician to have a better idea about uh, the disease, uh, thereby then design a bespoke treatment for the patient. And many times uh, surgical planning depends on the patient. And this is so possible because uh, the laws is kept low and then non-ossifying fibroma. We almost have too much information. However, in this fibroma, we don't know whether there is a cortical bone. Whereas here, we do see a very thin cortical bone. It's up to traumatologists to decide what to do. One of the things uh, that uh, we are counting a lot or not. We're talking about the stem cells uh, growth factors in morphological biochemical uh, studies. Uh, I mean, the biochemical study has been done so far with MRI or with T2 mapping, uh, which showed the alteration of cartilage layers. And then we had DJ Brick, which is a, a technique that would inject costume medium, but it's impossible to do that with MRI because. Uh, they limited the, the use of this drug in Spain. So to use uh, gags, we can uh, use uh, then arthro CBCT and color. And then using uh, uh, gags to see whether the area is likely to develop uh, arthritis or not. I no longer have time. Perhaps one final thing. Trabecular bone, and there we make a perfect quantification thanks to CBCT. As I said, it's quite difficult to summarize five years in just 20 minutes. So sorry about that. Thank you.